Hi, today we're going to have another look at the GPS Disciplined Oscillator project. Um, we've got our PCBs here from PCBWay, who incidentally are now celebrating their sixth year anniversary of providing low cost PCBs to hobbyists and professionals. And if you are thinking about getting a PCB made, then obviously consider going to their website linked down below. They've got a whole host of options, quite a lot more available than some of the other suppliers, including aluminium PCBs for your LED boards and even copper based PCBs for really getting the heat out of your circuit boards. But they've got a lot of options on here. So if you are thinking about getting a board made, consider visiting them. Now, what I thought we'd do today is have a little bit of a more relaxed look at what we're actually doing with the system, because I think in the last video, I probably just charged in with a lot of technical detail without the background information that's going on. So first of all, I thought we'd just have a little look at what we're actually doing with the system, what the microcontroller and the FPGA potentially need to do, and what their purposes are. So this is our basic system. We've got our GPS receiver, which is receiving all of the signals from the satellites in view of the antenna. It does a whole ton of ca computation and calculations in there. And ultimately, we get a one pulse per second signal out from that GPS receiver. Then we've got a 10 megahertz oscillator that has an adjustment pin or some way of adjusting the frequency on it. And then we have our controller in the middle. And what it's doing is looking at that one hertz signal, looking at the 10 megahertz signal and comparing the error and then basically trying to control that 10 megahertz oscillator very finely so that it gives an exact 10 megahertz signal out. Now there are some GPS modules that have the capability of outputting frequencies other than one hertz. The problem is, particularly with modules like the U-Blox modules, they're based upon a 48 megahertz temperature compensated crystal oscillator. And then you end up with a PLL in there that doesn't divide down perfectly. So you end up with a lot of jitter on the signal coming out of it. So really you can't use these GPS modules directly. You do need to have some other system that has a 10 megahertz reference at its heart. And in this project, we're using a ovenized oscillator. That's the thing that's underneath this foam block. This is a single oven oscillator, but what we really want is the most stable source possible because although this will work quite happily with even a basic crystal oscillator when we've got GPS signals, in the event of any loss of GPS or anything else, you want this system to be stable long term and at least give several days of holdover with very little drift. So you really want a crystal or oscillator solution that is inherently uh, quite stable in the first place. So a single oven oscillator, double oven, you can even tune some Rubidian standards, although they do have problems with the 10 megahertz output from those as well. Now there's a whole range of different ways that you can implement this controller and that's part of the fun for me with this project because we can have a play with a whole range of different algorithms log all of the long-term statistics and have a look at what's going on and determine the most appropriate way to control this 10 megahertz oscillator. Now, the main problem with this whole scheme is that our one hertz signal that's our reference is a long way away from the 10 megahertz that we're trying to control. So we can never implement a PLL, for example, directly because we're several orders of magnitude away with the frequencies. So we'll just never achieve a lock directly. So the first thing that we might want to implement, which is what I've implemented at the moment with this system, and in the brain of most people would typically make the most sense to start with, especially if you only want to use like a basic microcontroller. You've got your 10 megahertz signal going off and we've got our one pulse per second coming in. And what you could do, for example, is feed in this 10 megahertz signal into a timer peripheral on the microcontroller. And then every time we get this one pulse coming in, will count how many cycles the timer has recorded. And if we've recorded 10 million cycles, we'll know that we're basically at 10 megahertz. The problem with that is there's a whole range within the sine wave where we won't know how far off 10 million cycles we are. We don't have any resolution between these points here to know how far we're drifting away from 10 megahertz exactly. And we do want 10 megahertz to lots and lots of zeros if we can possibly have it. So directly, this doesn't work very well, although it will get you effectively 10 megahertz. So what I implemented with the FPGA is a means to oversample the sine wave coming in 
and basically we get one nanosecond resolution on this and from that we can work out the frequency to affect you know we've got our one nanosecond resolution here and we're able to control the oven oscillator and keep it within sort of one nanosecond longer term we can get even finer resolution but there are some problems with this board that I do want to discuss in this video. So what we've got here is uh, FPGA is the thing that's actually reading the signal from the 10 megahertz and it's doing some computation, the oversampling and feeding in a digital signal into our microcontroller that gives us the timing to one nanosecond precision. And then the microcontroller is what's doing the computation to work out how to adjust the DAC. One of the other things to consider with the frequency counter method is that the 1 pulse per second isn't necessarily synchronized with the 10 MHz reference at all, other than by making sure that the frequency is correct. This 1 pulse per second that you can see in red on the scope happens to be rising from around the bottom of the sine wave here, but depending on when it locked on, it could be anywhere along this sine wave without any particular preference, because the two oscillators are effectively running asynchronously and all we're doing is adjusting the frequency of the oscillator to make sure that it's exactly correct. There's no phase correlation between the two waveforms. Now, although I've got the frequency counter method working quite nicely on the board here, for whatever reason, the primary method of implementing a GPS disciplined oscillator has a phase lock loop at the heart of the control, or a PLL. And it's not actually involving frequency really here at all. It's looking at the input signal and the signal coming from the oscillator and it's comparing the phase difference between two rising edges on that signal. So if we had a look at our two signals here, it would be looking at the phase difference between uh, the rising edge on our one pulse per second and the rising edge on one point on the sine wave. And if there was a positive delay, then it would know to bring back the frequency slightly until they're exactly in phase. And if it was the other way, then it would know to increase the frequency until they're exactly in phase. So it wouldn't care about the frequency difference and that's where the problem lies with the GPS disciplined oscillator is that when we zoom out you know we've got millions and millions of cycles between the two signals so it could actually lock on to any of these particular rising edges on the sine wave and we could lock on to a whole host of different frequencies. So we would need to constrain the control range of the oscillator to some extent so that the control is basically only within one cycle. Now as I mentioned in one of my earlier videos Lars on the EV blog forum had come up with this sort of hybrid of the two so the Pro Mini is measuring frequency but it's also using a HC4046 PLL to look at the phase difference between the one pulse per second and a divided down version of the 10 megahertz coming in. And by dividing it down, we're eliminating quite a number of cycles here that it could accidentally lock onto. And if you choose those frequencies quite carefully compared to the control range of the oscillator, it means that you couldn't accidentally lock on to a random frequency. So this is quite a nice mechanism and it's something that I'm going to probably implement on the next version of the PCB. Now with this PLL, it's being converted from a phase difference into an analog signal and that analog signal is representing the time difference between the one pulse per second and one of the rising edges on the one megahertz and one of my subscribers mentioned this part which also looks really awesome and is definitely something that I'm going to implement on the next PCB. This TDC7200 is a time to digital converter and we can actually use this to look at the time difference between a 1 pulse per second and some divided down clock of the 10 megahertz reference in. And if you look at the specifications, they're really quite good. So we can get resolution down to 55 picoseconds and the stability and everything is really good. So I have actually ordered a few of these parts. We've got 10 of them here from Mauser. They're relatively inexpensive. Farnell haven't got them in stock at the moment, but they did say that they're getting a newer version in. So it might be worth keeping an eye on what's going on there. But this is really cool because it does a lot of the timing and everything for you and potentially could eliminate the FPGA from the system if you didn't want it in there and then brings the cost back down. And so here is the heart of the TDC7200 and basically we can feed our two signals into the start and stop of this controller 
and it will measure the time difference between those two rising edges and it does all of that for you and then presents the answer on an SPI slave peripheral. So very simple interfacing to a microcontroller and is something that we're definitely going to implement on the next PCB. Now one of the shortcomings of the design that I've implemented on this test rig is that the oscillator is probably the wrong choice. It's a single of an oscillator and it is a used device. I think it had a date code of something like 2011 on it. But what we're seeing is quite a lot of drift and as a result we're having to update the DAC value quite regularly and therefore we're never really achieving that really accurate lock onto the GPS signal because we don't quite have the precision to adjust the frequency with enough granularity given the amount of drift that we're seeing. And if we have a look at the datasheet for it, the pull range for the frequency adjustment is actually a little bit excessive. So anywhere up to basically one hertz of adjustment either way from 10 megahertz, which is quite a lot. It has the benefit that as the crystal ages, you don't have to replace it so often because it's able to deal with a wider drift of that oscillator. The downside is that for an application like this, where actually I just want the absolute stability, um, we don't quite have the control that I would like to see. Now, if we have a look at the very popular MV89, which is a double oven oscillator, you can see the control range is only a quarter of that of the oscillator that I've got on this PCB. So automatically, aside from having to worry about the control voltage, which on my oscillator is 0 to 8 volts, this one has a control range of 0 to 5 volts, so we're already increasing our resolution. But then our pull range is a quarter of that of the oscillator on my board. So therefore, we get quite a lot of extra resolution there for controlling this oscillator. And obviously, being a double oven oscillator, it has much better stability in the first place. Now, I did find some other oscillators on DigiKey that are brand new because this MV89, I don't think you can buy anymore. You can buy it secondhand on eBay for about $45. The problem is you've got no idea what you're getting. It could be right at the end of life and it may only have sort of a year's worth of use left after you've got it. So this one caught my eye, £62, which is a pretty good price for what it is really. And it has a decent control voltage range. So depending on which model you choose, it's either 0 to 3.3 or 0 to 5 volts. So I'll be increasing my resolution automatically with that. And then the pull range is 0 0.4 parts per million. So a lot more control anyway of the frequency. And then this one, which looked even better and only about a pound more, it has better initial accuracy. So 0 0.1 part per million. The daily aging is plus or minus 0 0.5 parts per billion, so that's pretty good. If you compare that to some of the other oscillators, um, it does look like a single oven oscillator, but it's already looking pretty good in terms of specs. Tuning range, uh, plus or minus 0 0.5 parts per million, and the control voltage, 0 to 5 volts. So that's pretty good. That seems to be uh, really what we want to aim for. And so I think I'm probably just going to try and shoot for a brand new oscillator in this device. If I come across a double oven oscillator or something that's not excessively priced, then I might just make sort of one gold standard GPSDO for me in the lab here that's more expensive. But I did want to try and make this suitable for some other people to build as well. So maybe we'll have some multiple footprints or I might just separate off the PCB with the oscillator on there so that we can uh, modify that depending on what's available on the market and then we just need to control it using a digital interface from the main board. So just a little bit about the general architecture for this design. The plan really is there's going to be one digital board at the center of the GPS disciplined oscillator that's going to have basically all of the options available to it. So I'm going to fit the FPGA fit a much better microcontroller. I'm already at the limits of this PIC24 with all of the floating point calculations. So I've already ordered some PIC32s to go on the PCB. Might be a mistake, I've never used them before, but they look like they could do all of the calculations and computations that we need. It's going to have that TDC7200. It's going to have the 4046 PLL as well, implemented very similarly to the one on the Lars example. So everything is going to be available for me to develop with and then if anyone wants to build this either we'll have already learnt 
what the best arrangement of parts is and so you don't have to fit everything or you could go ahead and fit everything and have a play and uh, use them all together and give some really nice interesting results. And then at the back of the unit there's going to be a PCB with the BNCs for the 10 megahertz output so we don't have to have a separate amplifier so we can have maybe eight outputs to go to the various pieces of equipment in the lab that can accept 10 megahertz input. It also might be quite nice to have an Ethernet port on the back connected to that PIC32 so that we can potentially implement an NTP time server. I don't know if there's a better choice rather than the PIC32. It might be that there's something similar to the ESP32 that already has everything developed for it, which we can just fire the data to. We'll have to have a little look at that. If anyone's had any experience with that, please leave those thoughts in the comments down below. Then the other part of it, which is probably the next part I'm going to design, is the front panel because that doesn't really depend on anything else that's in the PCB. Um, we're going to have, I think, two OLED modules at the front, some of the 256 by 64 um, three and a bit inch displays. They're relatively keenly priced. I think you buy them for about £25 each. And then we can have a dedicated display to the time and date and another one to statistics. And then if we do implement the NTP server, you know, the IP details and that kind of thing. And then maybe some buttons in the middle just to allow you to change some of the settings. So that's the general plan. I did consider obviously using one of these TFTs, but it's just too physically big. And I think I want it in sort of a one unit high 19 inch rack mount form factor. So this really could end up being quite an expensive development given the number of boards and all of the stuff that we're sticking on here. But what I'd like to do is keep the display board so that whatever technology that we have on the display doesn't really impact anything else. You could, if you wanted to, just not put a display. It could be headless or it could just display some very basic information. I think the idea is that the data is just going to come from the GPS mainboard and not too much going back the other way. And similarly, with the main PCB, if anyone wanted to build it, we don't have to fit all of the parts if we don't want to. And similarly, with the board at the back, if you didn't want all of the BNCs, you could just not fit any of those parts and just have a single 10 megahertz output. So hopefully quite a bit of flexibility, but I'm going to obviously try and go for the, the best that I can do in the lab here. So hopefully you found the video useful and it clarified a few things. If you've got any thoughts or comments, leave them in the comments section down below. A lot of you did leave some really detailed and really useful responses last time. And I'm not disregarding any of those. I just want to leave all of the options open so I don't build something and then really regret not having one little thing on there. So I'm going to probably implement everything that's been suggested, um, which is not my usual way of doing things. But I do want to make just one board once and then play around with it that way. Um, so yeah, thank you to PCB Way for sponsoring the video. Um, thank you to Stone for sending in this TFT and I'm going to continue using it for general monitoring of this until we get the new front panel PCB. So hopefully you enjoyed the video and until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>